get back with our interns that we love so much this summer. So we give thanks to God for that. As we enter worship, in this season of fall and change, we also remember the change in the world, the disrest in the world, the problems in Syria, our men and women that are serving in different branches of the military. So in the midst of all the distraction and hurt and pain in this world, we come into the house of the Lord to lift up our burdens and to give thanks to God, our Creator. Let us center our minds and our hearts on God as we come to worship. Trust in 
the Lord and do good. And the Lord gives strength to the people. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is our refuge and strength. Now let us continue in praise with our hymn of praise found on page 85. We believe in one true God.
now joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not with her? Why have they provoked me to anger with, these, with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Our psalter this morning comes from Psalm 4, which is found on page 741 in your hymnal. If the women of our congregation will say the bold print, the men will say the lighter print with me. <coughs> Answer me when I call, O God.
lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. And as we read, I commend this to you as a text to let it sit upon your mind, upon your lips, and upon your heart. Then Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided, decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in the very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in the very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And if you have not been faithful with that which belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be silent. It's wonderful to be back at Mount Bethel this morning. I appreciate the time to be away and also the opportunity to come back. It's also a joy to have my parents and grandmother here with us this morning. And I think many of you all met Sarah this summer, she said the word Somewhere? 
I mean, I do my best to pray for my friends and family, but I'm not sure I can pray for everybody. And I'm not sure I want to either. You may not know this, Paul, but I'm not on great terms with some folks at church right now. We seem to disagree about everything. The way we should spend our money, who should leave the congregation, or even what color carpet we should get in the sanctuary. They really hurt me the last time we talked. I don't want to shake hands with them on Sunday morning. How long do you expect me to pray for them? And what about that next verse, Paul? The one where you tell us to pray for kings and all rulers of the earth. Please tell me that's a typo. You can't possibly have meant for us to pray for them, right? I mean, have you heard what's been going on in Syria? Everybody is saying that the Syrian president used chemical weapons on his own people. He's killed hundreds of people and is doing nothing to stop this civil war. Even if I wanted to pray for him, I'm not sure it would do any good. But what about the man who killed all those people at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C.? Or the folks who shot innocent children in Chicago just a couple days ago? Those could be my kids, Paul. Do you want me to pray for someone who hurts my own children? One last question for you, Paul, and this is actually the important one. You wrote that we should pray for everybody because God desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Are you sure that God wants everyone to be saved? Even people who don't love Jesus? Even people who are enemies of the church? That's a hard thing to hear, Paul. And I'm not really sure I like it. I normally don't pray like that. And I'm not sure I want to start. Please write me back when you can. And let me know if I read your letter correctly. And please pray for me. And I'll do my best to pray for you and for everybody else. You are stubborn sibling in Christ. Andrew. Sisters and brothers, our epistle lesson from Timothy today is not an easy word. But it is clear. As much as each one of us might have wanted to write a letter like that to Paul and try to clarify some things or find some exceptions, <laughs> the answers wouldn't change. God's word has been given to us, and it does not change. And we will be blessed if we are not just hearers of the word, but doers also. And so how do we live out this command that Paul gives to us? How do we learn to pray for everyone, especially those who rule over us, especially those it would be easier to hate, maybe even those would be easier to ignore. Paul isn't in a position to write us back, even if he'd like to. I mean, I think that he's already told us one way that we can learn to pray for everyone. The apostle gives us the example of his own life, of his own transformation, as a way of learning to pray for those we hate and those we might prefer to ignore. Listen to these words that Paul wrote to Timothy, just a couple paragraphs before our lesson for today. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, 
as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Sisters and brothers, think back with me to Paul's story, back to the time when he was Saul. Before he met Jesus Christ, he was an enemy of the church. He hated the name of Christ and did violence against the followers of Jesus. He was someone that Christians would have wanted to hate. But God showed mercy to Saul. And God's grace overflowed in his life with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Saul was given a second chance a new birth, and a new name. Paul tells us that he is the foremost, the greatest, the chief of sinners. And <coughs> Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, all of us, everyone. And Paul's life is a testimony to this fact. God used Paul as an example of the power of Christ to bring new life, to make a new creation. All of the old things have passed away. Look, God makes all things new. And on that road to Damascus, God begins the new creation the same way that God began the first creation, with a blinding flash of that knocks Paul off his feet. When Paul encountered Christ on that Damascus road, his eyes were open to see the Christians he was persecuting in a new light. In that light of the new creation, Paul could see that he was no different from the Christians he was persecuting. He too was a sinner, trapped in the darkness of death, who God was calling into the light of life. In the light of that new creation, Paul saw that God was doing a new thing. That in Christ, God was calling all people from darkness to light. That revelation changed Paul and the entire course of his life. He went from being an enemy of the church to being a leader of the church. He was no longer a persecutor of Christians, but someone who urged his fellow Christians to pray for those who persecute them. Sisters and brothers, as we learn to pray for everyone, especially those it is easier for us to ignore or to dislike, we will be changed too. We will be forced to see them in a new light, the light of God's desire to save all people. That person we prefer to hate or ignore, that person is a child of God just as we are. A person God desires to save just as much as God desires to save me or you. Our prayers then will change us because we can no longer hate or ignore the people that we pray for. Yet Paul tells us that our prayers will change more than just our hearts. They will begin to reshape the world around us as well. Immediately following his instructions to pray for kings and all those in high positions of power, Paul gives us the reason why. So that Christians might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. The fact that Paul specifically reminds Timothy and his churches to pray for political leaders is especially striking because of the persecution that Christians faced at the time that Paul wrote this letter. Timothy and his churches probably were not facing the kind of violent persecution that would come later in Christian history, but there was still significant risk in being a Christian in asking them to pray for their kings and all their rulers, Paul is asking Timothy and his churches to pray for those who actively persecute them. And what's more, 
Paul expects a result that Christians will be able to live quiet and peaceable lives. How can it be that Paul expects prayer to change the situation? How can Paul expect that our prayers can do anything to stop chemical weapons or mass shootings or divisions in the church? Sisters and brothers, Paul expects prayer to change things because of the one in whom we pray. Listen once again to verse 5. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. In Christ, God has already acted in human history to save all people. Dictators, murderers, me, you, the Apostle Paul, and everybody else. The work of Christ on our behalf, and on behalf of the entire world, is already done. Christ has given himself a ransom for all, and showed us the depths of God's love for all of God's creatures. So when we pray as Paul tells us to do, we join in the work of Christ that is already done. Paul can expect our prayer to reshape the world because we pray with Christ as our mediator. And in Christ, God has already begun the new creation. We can hope that our prayers for all people, including the people we would most likely hate or ignore, those prayers will bear fruit because God desires that all people, all of us, to be saved and to come to know the knowledge of the truth. And sisters and brothers, that is the place where we have to start. In order to pray as God calls us to pray, we must remember who we are and who God is. We are God's beloved children. God is our loving parent, the most caring mother and father of everyone that God has made. And God's desire is that all of God's children come to know the blessing of God's salvation. Like the best human parents, God can't pick favorite kids. God desires that everyone would know the goodness and love of God's salvation. So let us take a moment to rest in the knowledge of who God is and to remember who we are. This is a little risky. Please don't fall asleep on me, but we'll try. I invite you to sit back, and to close your eyes, and to become aware of your breathing. Let the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus overflow in you as they overflowed in Let each breath in and out be a reminder of the God who gave you breath and who loves you beyond measure. You might say to yourself as you breathe, let me be filled with the love of Christ. Let me be filled with the love of Christ. And as you feel yourself filled with the love of Christ, you can begin to pray for those people who are hard to pray for. You can begin to remember that they, too, are children of God, and that God desires their salvation.
light of God's love for all. might say to yourself, may my enemy be filled with the love of Christ. Let her be filled with the love of Christ. And as our sister returns our attention to the room, you can be likewise. But as you do, Hold on to that feeling of being filled with the love of Christ. And take that feeling with you as you pray for everyone about everything. In your prayers for everyone, especially those that's easier to ignore or to hate, hold them in that light of God's new creation. Remember that God desires all of God's children who would come from darkness into light. And pray for them. You, me, the Apostle Paul. Let us now stand and affirm our